I'm, I'm going to start off by just trying to capture in my own mind the debate which I've seen for many years now actually, which is between the traditional nutrition-based agronomy approach, whereas, you know, it says if you got a short supply of nitrogen, you just put more nitrogen on and keep applying more nitrogen and more nitrogen, even though you probably applied more than you need. And then we've got the holistic organic approach where it's mainly talking about the biology and what's happening uh, in the soil. And if you add humates or various amendments, you'll fix the biology, which will fix the soil. And I guess, from my view, these are both ideological positions. And I think what I'm trying to present today is the reality of what we're experiencing in the paddock, okay? So, uh, first I'd like to acknowledge um, other scientists who've been working on this project, Mel Fraser from the southeast, Amanda Shapel, who's here, and Dr Nigel Wilhelm from Sardi. Um, I think I'll start with take-home messages first, in that we've been applying various forms of organic matter to soils in recent times and we're seeing some responses. But there's still some major issues. And these include that results have not been consistent. Um, and they do vary depending on the soil type. And it comes back to this here in that taking the traditional nutritional approach or the organic approach, no matter how much nutrition or bio amendments you apply to this floor here, you won't grow much. That's the bottom line. Organic matter alone may not address all the constraints. And we have to recognise that there's a whole range of issues in the soil which we're facing. It's not just a lack of biology. Biology is usually the end result of something else. The ability to incorporate large amounts of organic matter on a broad acre basis, we don't have the equipment to do it cost effectively at this point of time. And apart from some studies, the financial return has yet to be justified. So that's a harsh reality. So, um, well, all know that organic matter, soil organic carbon are important for soil health, applying nutrients, supporting biological activity, support physical, biophysical function. But it's determined by how much goes in compared to how much goes out. So if you're in a production system which is not maximising your inputs, then you'll be in a situation where you can improve your soil organic carbon. However, there is an upper limit and that limit is largely defined by the clay percentage of the soil. In other words, I, I term it the carbon retention capacity. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, and all these things are influenced by climate, management, and the soil chemical and physical characteristics. And these are very complex relationships. There'll be people just starting their careers now who will be looking at retirement and will still be answering and asking questions in this space, I guarantee it. Now, some of the studies which have been out there, which have shown good responses, this is work done by Peter Sale, Rennick Perrys in Victoria, the high rainfall zone. Uh, this was one site where the uh, rotation was wheat, wheat and then canola. They tried a variety of different amendments. Um, the control yield for those who can't see it in 2005 in the wheat was 7.6 tonne per hectare. The deep organics was 12.9 tonne per hectare, huge difference. In the following year, 3.6 tonne in the control, 5.6 in the organics. And then in canola in 20, 2007, 1.6 tonne and 2.5 tonne. Sounds really good. We've also got some sites in South Australia which we've used a subsoiling machine from Victoria, the same machine, applied different amendments at depth, um, 
this is last year, uh, you can see the difference between the control and the organic fertiliser. Um, still waiting for confirmation of the yield results, but we're talking two to three tonne yield increase. Pretty big outcome. Now, New Horizons is a project which um, Amanda and I, Nigel and Mel, have been working on for uh, since 2014. This is based on sandy soils in South Australia. Now, there's 2.6 million hectares of sands under agricultural production here. There's also about 1.5 million tonnes of heavier soil types which have got a constraint which we think we can address. So we're talking of almost half of the cropping agricultural area in South Australia has got a major constraint. So what we did is we, um, we had $2 million over three years, and that sounds a lot of money, but this is the cost of doing this research properly. It is very expensive. This was a proof of concept. In other words, this was about, well, we've had a lot of anecdotal evidence and also a lot of trials and demonstrations I've worked on previously have shown significant increases to the use of clay and organic matter on sands. We didn't have the level of science to support um, that those benefits. We set up three sites, one in the southeast, one in the Mallee and one on the peninsula. And we also undertook a social survey of farmer practice and what it would take for them to make and invest in changes on their sands. And we did an economic analysis of the results from the trial sites. This is Kaji, um, which is just north of Narracourt. Uh, long term average growing season rainfall is 375, but in 2014 and 2015, we had very low rainfall at that site. This is the soil type. So for those people who are saying, yeah, 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 we can just build carbon, we can just get bugs growing, anything below the top 10 centimetres down to the clay is a desert, okay? This is the problem we're dealing with. And 2014, 2015 results, now, the hatched bars are um, not significant to the control. So, the top bar is 2014, the bar next to it is 2015 results. And what you can see is that um, there's quite a bit of error in these measurements. In other words, on the five replicates on this site, we saw different responses from the same treatments in the different reps, even though the soil was pretty similar, okay? And it's one of the problems we've got, is that all the sites have got high degrees of inherent variability and um, which don't appear to be addressed through the treatment. This is Karunda, and um, this is a typical Mallee sand in the, in the June swale system. This one is not as gutless as the Kaji sand. It actually has higher inherent fertility levels. We had uh, two shocking springs at this site, particularly 2015 was really challenging. But you can see that the better treatments, which are generally the organic matter treatments, had a much greater yield than the controls. Now, what I'm talking about, some of the complexity here, is while you probably didn't have time to digest it, is that the deep nutrition treatments, this is a deep fertiliser of treatments, which we applied, high rates of fertiliser, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, trace elements, sulphur, performed better at the Karunda site than they did at the Kaji site, yet the Karunda site was more fertile than the Kaji site. So how we work that out, uh, we're still struggling with that. This is the Brimpton Lake site near Peninsula. Probably had more consistent rainfall than the other two sites during the year. This is a shallow sand over clay, but we did have some issues with water logging. And bearing in mind that our modification is only in the top 30 centimetres. So this is where we've applied um, deep nutrients. We've applied organic material, which we've spaded in to 30, 35 centimetres. We've spaded in nutrients to that depth 
and we've done justice spading treatment alone, which virtually, but not quite, uh, re replicates a deep ripping treatment. So what happened there? Good yield increases in both the two years, particularly where we've added organic material. The organic material was loose and hay at um, Kaji and Brimpton Lake, and it was loose and hay, uh, loose and pellets at Karunda, but high rates, 10 ton per hectare. So pretty high rates. Okay, um, we are involved in another project which I've been running on Air Peninsula, which is uh, in partnership with EP NRM Group. This is a carbon farming initiative project, which the main objective is to um, focus on soils with low soil organic carbon. One of the features, um, particularly of some of the work Amanda and I have done over the years, is um, that there's a large variability in soil carbon across sites. So in the state soil land information framework, there's about 1,100 soils which have been characterised. This is the range of carbons we're talking about, depending on texture. It doesn't matter what texture it is, there's huge variability. If we look at um, ranges in, a, um, in particular soil types, um, basically, sorry, um, texture is a factor, but again, even if you remove rainfall out of the equation as an influence, there's still large variability. Now these are the sites, um, Angara, Butler, Cockalichi, Crossville, uh, trial sites, and we've got demonstrations at a number of other sites. What we're looking at here is, again, similar sorts of treatments, but different soil types. Now this is a Butler site. Uh, this is a, actually potentially a good red-brown earth, but it is sodic, but the sodicity varies across the site. So when I mean sodic, I'm sure you all understand, we're talking about high levels of exchangeable sodium and also high levels of exchangeable potassium will cause soil dispersion. Now, on this particular site, 2015, we did see a significant difference in yield, but not that much. Certainly not enough to warrant the expense of doing the incorporation. Now, this is an Ungara site, which is also a sand over clay. This had similar results to our sand trials in New Horizons. Basically, you can double yield through a combination of clay and organic material. But similar to New Horizons, not in every year. So although we haven't statistically analysed the salt results fully, because Amanda's been busy, um, the bottom line is we saw no significant differences on either the Angara site or any of the three New Horizons sites to any of the treatments. So again, bearing in mind we have these large error bars, but we did not see the return in 2016 that we saw in previous years. Okay, where do we go next? One of the key problems we've got is we don't actually understand what's driving responses. When we've applied organic material, we are applying nutrients. We're probably applying them in a form which is probably more slow release than, say, urea or DAP. But what we haven't worked out yet is how much of a response we've seen to the organic matter treatments is due to nutrition or some other factor. Now, previous speakers talked about increasing carbon and increasing soil water holding capacity. Uh, we, in these trials, we've probably put out four and a half ton of carbon per hectare. We've undertaken soil water measurements, but we really have not seen any significant differences. That's partly because these sands are high leakage soils. So it's again very difficult to quantify the changes to soil water on these soils. We need to look at rates, form and depth of incorporation. 
For our EPNRM soil project, apart from the sand, we have not seen big responses in yield. We have seen better responses in biomass, which haven't translated to yield. But I suspect one of the problems is, is that on the heavier soil types, the only equipment we had available on Air Peninsula to incorporate material meant that we were only pushing material down to 15, maximum 20 centimetres. If you've got a soil constraint below that, and that was a constraint which was constraining your yield, you probably haven't addressed it, or at least not within this time frame. The work done by Peter Sal actually is showing that there have been large in changes to soil structure at depth around where they've slotted organic material deep into dispersive soils. So that's been quite a positive, but I think we need to consider just how do we get it down there. Because unlike many s systems, we haven't got the macrobiology such as worms, dung beetles and those things to transfer that organic material down into the subsoil. I've done an awful lot of soil tests and analyses over the years and on a lot of soils, people who, say at Yolanda, who've been farming no-till stubble retention for 25, 30 years, growing five, six, seven tonne of biomass every year, have hardly seen any change to their soil carbon in that period. Leaving material on the top is important from a land management aspect, but it's not really addressing the carbon problems underneath. Now, what we're doing about it is we're linking with the University of South Australia to look at uh, developing better machinery options. Um, and we're also linking with the GRDC, Sandy Soils and Subsoil Amelioration Projects, which commenced July 2016, which have, uh, the Sandy Soils has taken over the New Horizons program. And I'd just like to acknowledge all the landholders which have been involved because we've had some great support from landholders. There is a lot of interest out there, a lot of groups doing their own thing. We've worked with the farming system groups, Lower Ag Development Association, McKillop Farm Management Group, Mallee Sustainable Farming. They have members which are interested in this stuff. So a lot's happening, but we still have got a fair way to go. Thank you. Okay, no, good question. Um, two sites had loosened hay. Uh, one site had loosened pellets. The other sites mainly had vetch straw. Now, the interesting question about th this stuff has not been composted, but when we undertook pre-nitrogen or preceding nitrogen measurements, it was amazing within a very short time frame, three or four weeks, there was an awful lot of nitrogen had been released. So there must have been biological activity and breakdown occurring quite rapidly where you had soil moisture. We did do some root DNA analyses of treatments. Unfortunately, it didn't show us a lot in these trials. We have done it previously where we appeared to get quite large responses in root mass at depth to organic matter treatments. I think you're right. Um, 2016, you could almost say, was an irrigation type system. We had regular rainfall events occurring all the time and I don't think we were water limited and I suspect that's why we didn't see the responses. Okay, no, good question, Dan. Look, um, I've worked extensively with people like Roger Gruco from the southeast, who was a pioneer of delving sort of 25, 30 years back. And Roger also was a pioneer in bringing spaders over to Australia. And he's done a lot of work. And uh, we've seen examples on his property of canola crops, for example, which are yielding better than three tonne on sands which previously would have been pushed to deliver six, seven hundred kilos. Um, but it takes time and 
Roger's one of these guys who, um, I think we, we, Amanda and I were trying to find an unmodified site in Roger's farm, and I reckon the only place we could find it was probably his backyard, because, you know, he, he just is so busy doing things. And a lot of his farm, he would have delved, or clay spread, more, more than once. And he certainly spaded it at least once, probably twice across a lot of it. Because a lot of what we see with sandy soils is that where you've applied clay, it's either just been dropped on top and not mixed in properly. So the bleach day two horizons are a real issue in those soils and nothing's been changed there. Uh, or what you often tend to find is a sand with clay clods in it. So you actually haven't changed your sand from a loamy sand to a, you know, a clay sand. Um, so it's really difficult to actually suggest how much benefit you've made, particularly to soil organic carbon, if you've only changed 5 or 10% of the, the actual profile. So, you look, um, it's a work in progress. All this stuff is going to take time. Okay, yeah, um, first point I guess is the cost. On a trial basis, well it is only a trial and so everything's bought in. We have got landholders on Air Peninsula who are now doing things like spreading five tonne of medic hay from their own property and mixing that in. One landholder did that last year and got a one and a half tonne yield increase. Um, the increase is not so large this year but then that's consistent with all our trial work this year. So maybe next year you still get a big return. His back of the envelope calculations were that it, for him, if he could get the same sorts of yield increases over a five year period, that would well and truly pay for itself. But that's sourcing it on farm. And I think the general view of people like me and, and others I'm working with is that this is an opportunity for farmers to grow material on farm on their better areas and then take it and put it into their poor areas to lift production on those sites. Uh, when it comes to plant-based mechanisms, there obviously has been and is some research happening in that area. Um, I think it has got opportunities, but unfortunately, again, with our rainfall environment being so heavily winter dominant, a lot of our options are probably based more around things like sorghum and maize and millet and those sorts of things. Um, there are some better winter options out there, but I think the jury's still out pretty much on those. Because again, you know, the, the most extreme example and long lasting evidence I've seen was in Robin Graham's graveyard sites or Sexton project sites, which were done 25, 30 years ago. Some of those sites, some of those plots are still showing big responses right now, but only where all the issues have been addressed. So one treatment, he mixed in lawn clippings. So what he did, brought in a backhoe, dug a graveyard plot, and then put the soil back, usually in the same order. He took it out and mixed in. I went back to one site at Winilla 12 years after he'd done it, and we found intact lawn clippings, still recognisable as lawn clippings, at 50 to 60 centimetres depth. They had not broken down at all, purely because the soil structure, there was no oxygen, there's no biological activity, so nothing was happening. <laughs> 